please join me in welcoming today's speaker. Today's speaker is Taylor Dudley. And I'll tell you that here at the Barton Center, this is a little bit personal. Um, because we've had the great privilege of having Taylor as part of our staff at the Barton Center for the past year, where she's been serving as our 2010-2011 Robin, uh, Robin Nash Fellow in Law. And in this role, she contributes to our policy agenda, our legislative work. She helps us with our teaching requirements. She does student supervision and really takes a laboring oar in all of the activities of our center. She's moving on to greater horizons as her fellowship comes to an end. Uh, but she has, during her time with us, really developed a signature uh, focus on these issues of reproductive health, particularly for teenagers in foster care. And so she's really started a conversation here in Georgia that we're very proud of and helped to deliver some instruction and some skills to practitioners out there. So I hope you'll find it just as helpful as we have when we've delivered this to other audiences. And again, if you have questions, please uh, reserve them for the end, and we'll make sure and get to them and have a quality exchange. So please join me in welcoming Taylor Dudley. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to talk with you about this important subject matter. If I could just get uh, a gauge on who we have in the room, I'd love that. Do we have attorneys? Oh, wow. OK, how about social workers? OK, any uh, CASAs? Wonderful. Anyone else that I might be overlooking? OK, well, thank you all very much for being here. I hope that you'll find uh, this helpful and uh, that the subject matter is relevant to your work. We will go ahead and get started. Today we're going to go through a lot of different tools that uh, could help you in your practice with your various clients. So we'll start, though, by reviewing the unique needs and common outcomes among court-involved children related to reproductive health. And by that, I mean going to just lay a foundation for you so that you can see uh, some of the characteristics and statistics that are facing these children. Then we will move to talking about the legal authority and policies that support the delivery of reproductive health care and educational information such as, such as sex education to court-involved youth. And so we'll talk primarily today about preventing pregnancy. What can we do to get our child clients to receive the appropriate medical care and sex education that they're entitled to under law? But if we do have a pregnancy occur, we will talk briefly about the Parental Notification Act and then move on to the right to parent very, very briefly. So I like to start by doing a brief introduction on the importance of this subject matter. First, mentioning to the audience that pre preventing pregnancy is truly a matter of child welfare. And for those of us that do this work, certainly we know that working with children in foster care is important, not only because we want to protect them from the abuse or neglect that might be occurring at that time, but we also want to lay a foundation for them for them to be successful in their futures. And by preventing pregnancy, we certainly can help these children have a more successful future, better outcomes. Also, as you all know, uh, child well-being is certainly something we all pay attention to in foster care. And by preventing pregnancy, we can help these children have better emotional well-being, better physical well-being, and certainly better mental health. But by doing that, uh, we need to also keep in mind that a lot of these kids are doing the are taking the sexual risks that they are taking because of certain uh, emotional characteristics that they might have experienced because of their abuse or certain mental health characteristics that they might possess. In terms of the bigger picture of child welfare and what that means financially, I, I think it bears uh, mention that teen pregnancy generally, so not uh, teen pregnancy and foster care, but teen pregnancy generally costs the United States $10.9 billion in 2008. And $2.8 billion of that was for child welfare pregnancy alone. And so in a time like this where we're constantly thinking about uh, you know, saving money, uh, I think it also bears worth mentioning that it's, 12, 000, it's about $12,000 for a Medicaid birth or $200 a year for a young person to be on contraception. And so these are things that I think are just important to bear in mind when we're working with our clients and trying to even talk with legislators, policymakers about how important it is for these kids to access the services that they need. Finally, if you are an attorney not necessarily working with children in child welfare, but rather working with kids in the delinquency system, certainly these uh, principles apply. 
And they also apply to boys. Um, I'm, you'll often hear me talk about girls, but they do apply to boys and girls um, on the same token. And certainly apply to kids that are LGBTQ or also uh, developmentally disabled. Uh, a lot of times we might have an LGBTQ client and think that they're not necessarily um, at risk of becoming pregnant, but I've heard repeatedly from attorneys that you know, they thought that their client was with a same-sex partner, but then found out that their client was either a father or uh, soon to be a mother. And so certainly these are uh, you know, principles to apply to all of our kids that we're working with. Just to paint a statistical numerical picture for you of what this issue looks like, in um, the Midwest, uh, a study was conducted with about 700 youth, and that's actually been the broadest scale study that's been done in terms of how many kids are afflicted um, by teen pregnancy while in foster care. And that study found that by 19, nearly 50% of children or female youth in foster care have been pregnant and that female youth in foster care are 2.5 times more likely than those not in foster care to have been pregnant by 19. And again, that's a statistic that you will probably hear if you look at all. If you, for instance, if you like Google, you know, how many kids in foster care become pregnant, this 2.5 times more likely is the statistic that's always used uh, because it's really the only one that exists. There is truly a lack of data uh, a real dearth of data surrounding how many kids in care are becoming pregnant, but again, in this study, it found this information. 46% uh, of teen girls in foster care who have been pregnant have had a subsequent pregnancy, and so certainly that's something that is, is really important if you have a client and they are pregnant, uh, or they are pregnant for the first time, knowing that they face this kind of likelihood of becoming pregnant again is even scarier. And finally, when it comes to the boys, 50% of 21-year-old men aging out of foster care reported they got someone pregnant compared to 19% of their peers. And in large part, what we'll see is these numbers are high like this because of the backgrounds that these kids have in terms of their sexual risk taking, in terms of the sexual abuse that they may have been subjected to, the, the physical abuse, the neglect. It lends itself to a, a real level of risk that these kids take giving rise to these very high numbers. We'll turn now to talking a little bit about why prevention matters for these kids, but before we do that, I want to show you all a brief clip um, on pregnancy and foster care. And I think it does a really great job at painting a picture of what these kids think about this issue and what those who work with these kids think about this issue, and, and by that I mean these are people that work on teen pregnancy prevention on a daily basis. So I hope that this will be helpful, and um, most people that watch it say it does paint a really good picture for them, lay a really good foundation, and then we'll move on to talking a little bit more about this. So we'll go ahead and put this on. Pregnancy is prevalent amongst foster care youth just as it is among a lot of youth in America. I mean, the U.S. has the highest rate of teen pregnancy and birth in the entire industrialized world. For people who work every day on the issue of preventing teen pregnancy, there's always been an understanding that certain groups of young people are at greater risk and foster care youth would be among those. I suspect that what the U.S. public doesn't really know in the foster care community on this issue is really how prevalent it is. I'm not saying people don't suspect that maybe foster care youth have babies the way many teens do in this country, but I don't think they realize that the level is about two and a half times that of young women who are not in foster care. I mean, this is a major, major issue. When you look at teen parents in the foster care system, you find, in essence, an invisible population of youngsters that are in the system that came in because of safety issues, and now they have some added issues of becoming young parents at an early age. The foster care system is not ready today to address their particular needs. So becoming a young parent at a point where they themselves are preparing for a significant transition in their lives um, just complicates the likelihood that these youngsters will be successful once they leave foster care.
We know that at least a quarter of young people who have one pregnancy have a repeat pregnancy within 24 months. We know that about 80% of pregnant and parenting females end up going on welfare. For males, they end up earning less than their peers who are not teen fathers. They certainly have less schooling. And when we look at those who are at risk, we know that young people who are in foster care and aging out of foster care are a very vulnerable population and those who are pregnant and parenting are even more vulnerable. Their statistics are even higher in terms of the percentage who have pregnancies, the percentage who have repeat pregnancies. It creates a cycle of poverty, a cycle of disadvantage that we really want to stop. From my experience, I think the reason why I was getting pregnant is because I didn't have a family and I felt like, you know, my baby's father, maybe we can make a family and it'll be different. Oh, not again. Oh. Mama, I'm getting a little stuck. Okay. Do it matter what the, the middle is number mean too? Yeah. Oh. So that's Four, one first. 484, 448. You know your child is going to love you no matter what. And it's having something you never had. You know, if you never had a mother or a father in your life, so you feel like first. having that child is going to be your best friend. But just because you have a child does not mean that you're going to be with the father first off. That's for the mothers. And that at some point you have to stop the cycle, repeating the cycle of, you know, your family being in care. What is positive about being a single parent living in poverty? Nothing. Oh, you're pregnant, that is so cute. It's not cute for a 17-year-old that's in foster care to have a child. You're gonna struggle and you're gonna repeat the cycle and you're gonna be more stressed out because you have a child taken away from you or you haven't finished your high school diploma or GED and now you're stuck with a child. I don't see anything positive that you can can say. You're starting your own family, but how are you going to take care of your family? The reason why kids in care have children of their own at young ages is to fill a void. It's to fill a gap. A lot of kids go through a lot of emotional abuse, physical abuse. Um, a lot of kids are molested and raped, so that leads to difficulties forming relationships later on in life. For a youth who is lonely, they would feel more susceptible to become pregnant, to have that one person who cared about them. We're just recycling a cycle that hasn't been effective. We're creating what used to be known as second generation poverty and we're spinning it into third and fourth generation poverty. Young people in group foster care, particularly that we've worked with, um, have not had a lot of adults in their lives they could trust, have been in vulnerable situations where they weren't protected, and they're looking for affection and love and stability and a type of family they haven't had in their growing up years so far. If we want to reduce sexual risk-taking behavior among young people. We need to also be looking at how does that happening in the adult population? Where are young people getting their messages? Where are they getting their information? If we're not providing good quality programs and experiences and opportunities during school, during out of school time for these young people, they're providing it on their own. They need people who can speak up and speak out on their behalf and who can help them speak out on their own. I think society at large needs to understand that there is a completely different dynamic when you're talking about foster care youth. If social service providers met the young people where they were with the community networks in their neighborhoods, talking to the elected officials, then ultimately we will be preventing pregnancy. But we can't just stop there. We also have to fulfill those needs that are lacking. You can't just get the message out there without providing them with an alternative, a, a, an alternate way of living you know, that will ultimately reduce uh, pregnancy. 
we got to talk to these kids. I mean, there's this, you know, it's like something we don't talk about, you know, and you don't want to talk to kids about it, and kids don't like to talk to grown-ups about it, and, you know, there's all sorts of discomfort around even discussing it, whereas discussing it really is necessary first step. Caseworkers need to talk to foster parents, and foster parents need to talk to kids, and caseworkers need to talk to kids, and kids talking to kids, I think, is a huge part of addressing this issue, you know, because kids who have been there and done that can be far more persuasive than any of the rest of us on what the consequences are, and yes, it can happen to you. Although my experience with the peers are, you know, I'm happy I had my child and everything, I wouldn't suggest having a child at all, period. To struggle yourself and bring another human being in this world to look after and just to make sure that they grow up with the armor that you need to live in this world and survive, installing in them everything that you know. You know, you're their teacher, so you have to teach them. And if you're a teenager yourself, how can you teach them when you still need to be taught? Hopefully that helps with just laying a foundation to see, uh, hear from the youth themselves and also just hear from some individuals that work with these kids. I'm sure that many of you could speak to this issue in the same exact way, though, working with these kids in the way that you do. But uh, in terms of, of what that you know, video showed us in a nutshell, uh, we, can, we can definitely say that early parenting compounds the challenges that these kids face. Uh, and increases the likelihood of their poor outcomes. All of us in this room know that children in foster care face limited educational opportunities, that they face income disparity and poverty, that they are likely to have poor health, poor health outcomes, and that they are also likely to later um, become incarcerated. And again, that's probably why many of us are here, is because we want to prevent these very things from happening. But when kids become parents at young ages, all of these things just become that much more likely that the, that the kids will experience. And we also know that the babies that are born to these teen mothers face poor outcomes, and this is in large part because of the cycle. That they, become, they get removed from their teen mother, they go into foster care, and then they experience those same poor outcomes. And finally, even if that doesn't happen, um, that the baby gets removed, it could be that the baby will have a very poor health outcome simply because of a teen pregnancy being very high risk, mom not necessarily accessing prenatal care in the way that she could or should. This uh, quote right here, I think, summarizes this issue very nicely. Uh, it's Ann Dworsky, or excuse me, Amy Dworsky at, Dworsky at Chapin Hall at University of Chicago does a lot of the research on pregnant and parenting teens and foster care. And she speaks to this issue by saying that we can provide youth in care with all the contraception in the world, but pregnancy rates among this population will remain exceptionally high unless the factors that motivate so many of these adolescents to become pregnant are addressed. For some youth in foster care, having a child may be seen as a way to create a family of their own, a family who will love them and who they can love, or to demonstrate that they can do a better job of parenting than their birth parents had. Addressing these motivations means giving teens in foster care a reason to delay pregnancy and childbearing. They need to believe that they can complete their education, find a good job, and succeed in life. And for those of us here, we likely know this, and we can learn and we will shortly, about uh, all the legal tools that exist to provide these youth with access to contraception. But there is, of course, this bigger hurdle to overcome as related to really helping these kids believe that they can complete their education, find a good job, succeed in life. And I think that that takes a, an, a personal finesse and a, and a personal investment in each one of our clients that we might not always necessarily have the time for, given our caseloads or um, feel that we have the skill set for, but we'll try to, to equip you with at least um, some knowledge today that could uh, lend itself toward talking with these kids and helping them avoid uh, unplanned pregnancy. We'll go through a few of the factors that give rise to pregnancy in a little bit more detail, and uh, then we will start talking a little bit about the law. American Academy of Pediatrics found that a significantly higher incidence of childhood sexual or physical abuse has been reported in the backgrounds of teens who become pregnant. And another study that was done found that as these types of issues 
increase in a child's life. So domestic violence plus incarceration of family members plus household substance abuse plus household mental illness, that increases the likelihood that a young person will become pregnant uh, in foster care. In terms of uh, the opportunities or the hope that a young person might have about their future, a really helpful study found among the youth that they talked to that so many of these kids just felt that they lacked opportunity, that they lacked hope, and they just didn't think they had anything else better going for them other than to become a young parent. And to that end, these kids found, said that you know, there would be meaning in being a parent. They could have a family. They could really have someone that would finally love them and that they could have a chance to raise a family the right way. And again, this is in large part because of the lack of a positive family influence. It could be, and as many of you all know, that mom was a teen mother. We go to court and we see our, our parents in there, and they're very young, and it might just be a part of the culture that this, this family has children at a very young age. And getting in there and really helping these kids see that, um, that they do have a, a different kind of future ahead of them is actually something... Um, it could be very difficult, but nevertheless is a conversation that could be very helpful and very effective in having. A recent article that I read um, out in California talked about preventing pregnancy among Latina youth, and it talked about how talking to these kids about, um, Latina youth in particular, about their, um, about how becoming pregnant at an early age wasn't good, um, really didn't resonate with these kids because that's all that they ever saw in life. And certainly in Latina culture, family, childbearing, all of these things are very valued. And so what they started finding, though, is that when they started talking with the kids about education and about coming here to the United States, if they are a first-generation immigrant family and having additional opportunities, going on to college, being equipped with tools to create a better life for that young person and their parents, given that many young people feel pressured to care for their parents and care for their families later in life, that started to resonate. And so it might be that you have to give your message to one child in, a one, in one way and to another child in another way based on the way that they perceive uh, you know, the importance of family and the importance of delaying pregnancy. And again, just the influence of parents in all of this just really can't be under or over, overstated. 46% uh, of teens say that their parents are the that most influence their decisions about sex. When it comes to a lack of knowledge or a lack of access and inconsistent use um, when, in terms of contraception, so many kids say that these are the reasons why that they might uh, become pregnant at an early age. And so for all of us here, it's that much more important to make sure that our kids do have uh, you know, the knowledge that they need, that they are getting sex education through their ILP program, or they are getting sex education at school, or that the caseworker is sitting down having the conversation with them about how all this happens and works. Uh, we could start to see some of these numbers go down. Alternatively, if they know everything they need to know but aren't necessarily getting access to um, contraception or to the health care that they need, providing them with, uh, you know, contacts, planned parent, contacts for Planned Parenthood or contacts with the local health department um, and making sure that they're seeing the doctor on a regular basis could be very helpful. And also just in terms of inconsistent use, it's one of the biggest issues uh, among young people is that they don't use um, contraception on a consistent basis, and so talking with them about uh, reversible long-acting contraception could be equally beneficial. And lastly, one of the biggest things that kids talk about is, is just not, you know, summing it up by saying it doesn't matter if it happens, and that goes again to some of these issues related to not having a, ho a hope or not having a future. Um, or kids will say that it will happen when it happens, and, and when they're saying that, what um, the research shows is that the kids don't really understand how basic human biology works. And so they think, well, even if I do take birth control, I can get pregnant, which we do know can happen, but the likelihood of that happening is very low, and, and they don't really realize that. And so, again, it's all about ensuring that these kids have access to the medical care that they need and also to the sex education that they need to make sure that they know how their bodies work and they know how to prevent pregnancy. 
So we're going to take a quick break, if you all would like, um, about 10 minutes, and then we'll turn and talk about some of the law and policy related to this issue. We are going to turn now to the law and policy related to preventing pregnancy and foster care. So we'll start by talking about the state law, move to some of the DFACS policies where really a lot of this uh, issue lies. We'll turn to quickly to some juvenile court rules that might be applicable, and finally to federal law, fostering connections. In terms of Georgia state law and DFACS policy, we start with the principle that Legal custody means a legal status that's created by a court order embodying the responsibility to provide a child with ordinary medical care. Now, we've spent some time at the Barton Center trying to articulate what that term ordinary medical care, mean, ordinary medical care means and haven't uh, had a lot of luck. It's not defined in law and we don't necessarily find it defined in law in other states, but ordinary medical care according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, tends to mean um, general health care that is age appropriate, age appropriate that a child would receive as uh, they grow. And so certainly for children who are entering their adolescent years, we can then see the correlation between providing ordinary medical, ordinary medical care, I, sorry, um, to children and uh, making sure that they have access to the resources that they need to prevent pregnancy. In terms of DFACS policies that relate to this issue, um, DFACS policy says that upon entering care, children are required to have a health check within 10 days. According to DFACS policy, the health check should consist of the following. You can read it for yourself. And uh, all of the age appropriate components must be completed for each screening visit, and a health check is considered a screening visit. So right there, we see the obligation and the responsibility to provide children with First, ordinary medical, ordinary medical care. I'm sorry that I cannot get that out today. Uh, ordinary medical care. And then uh, the next responsibility is to provide age-appropriate components of that care to children in foster care. As far as the case manager responsibilities go, it is, of course, their primary responsibility to arrange appropriate and timely medical care, to follow up on doctor's recommendations to help children and teens learn about sexual development and sexuality, collaborate with foster family or the provider to arrange for medical, medical services the child needs. And again, all of this is right out of the defects policies. If you were to look in the defects policies, you would find them there yourself. And um, these are things that as a child's counsel or as a child's guardian ad litem or as a uh, you know, anyone working with a child that, that we have a responsibility to ensure uh, that they're receiving these services. And in terms of, of some of the, the stickier issues uh, relating to dating and contraception, there is a policy in DFACS policies that says that um, when it comes to contraception and dating that the case manager should try to seek a consultation with the parent and uh, if the rights have not been terminated as it relates to dating and contraception. However, when I gave this presentation a few months ago to a bunch of caseworkers uh, and some of the DFACS leadership, they said, well, no, we will make sure that kids get this stuff regardless. And I'm certainly not trying to speak for them, but that's what I've heard at least. Um, and so it shouldn't be a barrier. The parent should not be a barrier for these kids. In terms of the juvenile court rules, um, by statute as well as in the juvenile court rules, a judge may order uh, a child to be examined at a suitable place by a physician. And so for us as attorneys, it could be very helpful to utilize this statute if you find, for instance, that your child client has not had the appropriate medical services that they're entitled to per statute and per DFACS policies. If you find that your child has not necessarily seen a physician, they're not getting the counsel that they need, it, need related to contraception or reproductive health care, it might be something that you ask the court then to order that the child receive uh, these medical services. And if that is something that the judge chooses to order, certainly the judge cannot mandate that the child uh, take birth control or that the child um, you know, be treated with a long-acting 
reversible contraceptive device, but again, the judge can at least order that the child uh, be examined, and it's up to the case manager then to make sure that what the physician is providing the child with is age appropriate and is information that is relevant to preventing pregnancy. A lot of people, um, when they hear about consent or they hear about confidentiality, they think that they're the same thing sometimes. And for us, it's very important to know that these are two very distinct issues and they affect kids in very different ways. So in terms of consent, if you have a female client, regardless of her age, under Georgia law, she can consent to, her, to medical procedures or treatment in connection with pregnancy, prevention of pregnancy, or childbirth. So there is no age of consent requirement related to pregnancy prevention services here in Georgia, with the exception of terminating a pregnancy. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But when it comes to confidentiality, minor consent to a physician relaying information about their health care to a parent is not required. So children in Georgia who may be able to consent to their own medical, medical care cannot necessarily maintain that information as confidential. And you may be thinking, well, what about HIPAA? And HIPAA, in this instance, uh, does not become implicated because of the state law that is provided for here. So HIPAA has an explicit exception that says where under state law it provides that uh, information about the child's care, health care can be released to the parent, then um, HIPAA does not become implicated. However, there's an exception to that which says that um, where the physician fears that the child may be abused or otherwise subjected to harm because of the release of information, then the physician may in their own discretion choose not to release that information. So that's a great way for physicians that are working with, working with all youth, not necessarily foster care youth, to, um, to protect those kids. But also for our kids that are in care, um, but the parents may not necessarily have their rights terminated, there is that option there that can protect these kids and allow them to receive confidential health care. And also, should a child uh, want to obtain confidential health care, they can go to a Title, um, Title 10 clinic. And a Title 10 clinic is uh, basically like Planned Parenthood. A lot of county health departments are funded by Title 10. And those, again, are uh, facilities where children, regardless of age, can receive confidential services and consent to those services. And if you're possibly wondering where a Title X clinic is, um, you can go to uh, just Google um, the Office of Population Affairs Clearinghouse. Again, that's the Office of Population Affairs Clearinghouse. They have a link right on the left-hand side of their homepage that says, like, find a clinic. And you type in your address, your zip code, and you could um, find a Title X clinic where your child client can go and receive confidential uh, health care services related to pregnancy prevention. Sure. Office of Population Affairs Clearinghouse. Okay. I have never actually been to an ILP program myself. However, they should be telling the kids about pregnancy prevention. I don't know that they're necessarily telling them you can go to a Title X clinic and get those services in a confidential way, but it is certainly something that they could tell them that might be very helpful. In terms of emergency contraception, um, if you have a incident with a child client where they tell you that they may have recently had uh, unprotect unprotected sex or um, some other type of issue occurred where they think they might be pregnant and it's within a certain window of time, about three days, uh, then your client could access emergency contraception and they can do so again, Planned Parenthood, Title X Clinic, County Health Department, if funded by Title X. And if they're 17 or older, they um, can 
get Plan B without a prescription, they can get it over the counter. If they're 16 and under, they need to get a prescription to get um, their Plan B emergency contraception. And so that's, again, where you might come into play is, is working with them to help them understand, you know, that they have these rights to get this if this is what they need. And not only that, but help them access the right type of place that can provide them with this medical care. Yes, ma'am. Right, emergency contraception cannot be used to um, terminate a pregnancy. So once the, the young person knows that they're pregnant, emergency contraception will not be effective. It truly is that something that should be taken um, within three days of unprotected sex and in order to prevent a pregnancy from occurring. And there, you know, there's a lot of confusion among um, just people thinking that emergency contraception is, is something similar to an abortion, but it's totally different and acts to prevent a pregnancy from happening. So moving on to federal law, um, fostering connections is something that many of us in this room may be familiar with, but uh, just to summarize, it requires states to develop a plan for ongoing oversight and coordination of health services and provides opportunities for prevention by way of education and health care. We'll look now at some of the key ways that we can prevent pregnancy using some of the provisions in foster care. And we should just know that here in Georgia, various portions of fostering connections have been implemented by way of defects policy, by way of state law, um, but there certainly remains uh, some gaps between policy and practice. And these, again, are, are uh, opportunities to really start thinking about how we can use this a great federal law to help these kids prevent pregnancy. So in terms of uh, the first section 202 of Fostering Connections, um, that provision requires that there be a transition plan for children aging out of care. And that refers again to some of the ILP services that these kids might have. And you know, there's this provision in Fostering Connections that says within 90, you know, 90 days of aging out, the young person should receive uh, services related to um, a, a number of health care issues. And it goes down this big long list. And one of those things is um, sexual health care, preventing pregnancy, et cetera. And I always kind of have to um, perhaps say that we maybe could have done a little bit better there. Because if the young person is about to age out of care, that means that they're almost 18. And that's a little late to be talking about um, preventing pregnancy. But nevertheless, it's there and certainly provides a vehicle for us to have that conversation. Uh, but hopefully, we're talking about this much earlier. Again, starting around age 11 is when the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends doing so. So also, uh, one of the key things here is just to really be encouraging our caseworkers to distribute resources on health care, healthy relationships, and the consequences of early pregnancy. Um, in terms of that transition plan. Also, there's a great opportunity in Fostering Connections for a short-term training reimbursement. And again, one of the biggest issues that we see and what social workers will report and attorneys and foster parents and anybody that's working with these kids, uh, they'll say, we just don't know what to say, how to say it, um, when to say it, the age that's right, how you talk to boys versus how you talk to girls. And so there's this great provision in Fostering Connections that says there can be training reimbursement as related to uh, really any type of training. But you know, if we find a need for training on sex education or training on preventing pregnancy, then uh, certainly that opportunity uh, is here in law for us. Um, now that, of course, takes some coordination with the um, with the various agencies in the state, and I'm not here to advise on how that might happen, but nevertheless, the opportunity is there, and that's just something to know about to, to help put a little bit of pressure on and say, this is something that's there, let's utilize it. And finally, um, Section 205 of Fostering Connections says that we should have a health oversight and coordination plan, and of course, that just goes back to these regularly scheduled age-appropriate physical exams with the appropriate doctor. And by appropriate doctor, I mean that we shouldn't 
um, be taking our 15-year-olds to necessarily to the same doctor that they saw when they were two. Uh, there might be a different delivery of services going on there, and certainly uh, some physicians are definitely more trained to provide services to adolescents than they are to provide to young children. So in terms of fostering connections, again, it just provides a really good opportunity for us as attorneys or um, case managers to review our clients' case files for documentation of a comprehen comprehensive health care assessment at entry into foster care and periodically. Again, if, if it's lacking, we can ask the court to order, provide those services to the young person. Also, as an attorney, expect inquiries from the court about the health of your client or ask for it. If the court's not asking, again, ask for it. And this is particularly important with your child client who may have had uh, one pregnancy already and might be looking at a repeat pregnancy. So um, I know that, for instance, at an upcoming uh, conference for some of the judges, they'll be talking about this issue, preventing pregnancy. So it is something that is starting to, to kind of rise up within the community here in Georgia. And so hopefully it's something that you'll start hearing more people talk about and, and thus communicate more about with our, with our child clients. Remembering back to the video that we watched, you know, it talked about how we need to have attorneys talking with caseworkers and caseworkers talking with youth and youth talking to youth and youth talking to judges and, you know, it's this huge web of people that need to be talking about this in order for us to help these kids, you know, have healthy futures and, and prevent pregnancy. So if you do come across a client that uh, may be pregnant and express to you their desire to um, terminate that pregnancy. I just want to briefly go over what that looks like. I know that my focus tends to be on preventing pregnancy, but um, a lot of times people ask for this, and so I, I try to just do a brief mention of it. Um, the statutes that are relevant are mentioned here, and of course in Georgia, Georgia is a parental notification state, which um, means that the young person needs to actually notify their parent that they intend to terminate their pregnancy. It's not a consent state though. South Carolina, for instance, is a consent, consent state and that means that the parent actually must give their permission, whereas here in Georgia, they just need to notify the, their parents. And um, for our kids though, of course, you might be thinking, well, they're not in touch with their parents or the parents' rights have been terminated, so parental notification is not an issue. So, of course, then we turn to the judicial bypass. And as attorneys working with these kids, um, we need to know what the requirements are. And so in order for a young person to uh, access judicial bypass in Georgia, the court must make a finding that the young person is either mature and well-informed about their decision or that um, notice to a parent is not in the minor's best interest. And there really isn't a lot that interprets what these things mean. However, there is one case, in right EH, which does look at this issue. And I'll go ahead and just kind of read through a little bit what the court said about some of these, um, about what you know mature and well-informed means. Uh, in this case, in right EH, a juvenile court held a hearing and questioned a 16-year-old minor and the doctor who confirmed the pregnancy and the doctor who consulted with EH at the court's request. However, the court noted in its opinion that denied the judicial bypass that neither doctor was the child's doctor, that, no pers that the child had no personal physician, and that the child had not spoken to uh, the doctor that she planned to have terminate her pregnancy in Columbus. And so the court found that she made the decision without talking with any of these important people. Therefore, she was not well informed, and uh, she had not consult because she had not consulted with her doctor. And so again, when you are looking at how a young person in your uh, on one of your cases might access birth or excuse me might access um, judicial bypass, they need to be well informed such that they've spoken with their doctor, with the regular physician that they uh, frequent um, or that they plan to have terminate the pregnancy. Again, this is according to case law. Certainly, 
this is what the case law is saying, and um, practice may be different. You know, as with all things policy, case law, you know, it varies oftentimes in terms of practice. But just to give us all some some guidance and some um, some you know just a backing to rely on in terms of what to do and how to make the arguments, um, this is the case you'll find it in. Yes. Where does the putative father come in? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a that's a great question, and that's certainly. Um, that's a great question, and um, it's my understanding that permission from the uh, putative father or the um, actual father is not required um, in, in, the instant, in this instance or in any other instance for youth in foster care or youth not in foster care. An adult woman, permission is not required. It's her decision. A lot of times the putative fathers come in with the... Um, with the uh, young girls and our, our source of financial, mm -hmm. you know, support. Well, they have no rights. No. Okay. Yes, ma'am. When, when you say parental notification, is that the parents were left a voicemail or is there a legal document? Like, how, <laughs> how specific is that, especially if you're dealing with a teen that yeah. doesn't see their parent on a consistent basis or have the best relationship with them? Um, right. I mean, how, what kind of verification is there, you know, that the parent is actually notified? So, in the statute, um, it says that, so, no physician or other person shall perform an abortion upon an unemancipated minor under the age of 18 unless... A, the minor seeking abortion shall be accompanied by the parent or guardian, and then it talks about that. And then it says the physician or physician's qualified agent gives at least 24 hours actual notice in person or by telephone to the parent or guardian of the pending abortion, and then it talks about that. And then, or the physician or physician's qualified agent gives written notice of the pending abortion and the address of the place where the abortion is to be performed, sent by certified mail, return receipt, all that. Um, and so you can find and read more about this um, in section 15-11-110, and that's where it goes into, that's like the whole section, and then the specific notification section, though, is 1511-112, and that's where it details everything in terms of, like, who has to get the mail or who has to get the message and, and all of that. Certainly. Okay. Just to follow up briefly on where I left off, um, in terms of this notice issue, just to be complete, um, in the case that I was talking about, the court found that, um, the juvenile court found that the reason the, the young person did not want to tell her parents did not stem from any fear that they would abuse or harm her if they found out about the pregnancy, but rather that she simply did not want to tell them. Um, she did not want to tell them because uh, she was afraid they'd make her stop seeing the father. She also felt her parents would not want her to have, or excuse me, would want her to have the baby. And her third reason was that she, her parents had gone through an unplanned pregnancy the year before with her brother, and she didn't want to put them through that again. And so she didn't want to tell them, but because the court said she wouldn't be subject to uh, abuse or harm, uh, that wasn't a good enough reason, and so uh, the court denied the judicial bypass. So that's, again, just to be um, thorough, but again, judicial bypass, uh, is likely going to be our option for these youth. Turning now to the right to parent, uh, just again, my focus always is on prevention, and I, I that's really where I usually draw the line in the sand. But um, I try to at least talk about these subsequent issues just because um, they're so related. And so, in terms of the right to parent. Uh, I just want to briefly mention that a lot of times um, there's some confusion about what happens once a young person does have a baby. Does the baby automatically go, in, go into foster care? And the answer to that is, is a definitive no. Um, this is in DFAC's policy now. And it says explicitly, this is the policy written here for you, that the Title IV-E program allows a state to claim Title IV-E reimbursement for the cost of an infant living in the same placement as his or her minor parent, this provision does not require defects to obtain custody of the child. And I, I capitalize not, not because I'm like I'm doing that in my own editing, but rather that's how defects writes it. 
And they put this other provision here that says, no, the child shall remain in the custody of his or her minor parent unless it is otherwise determined by the SSDM that the minor parent's protective capacities places the infant in danger of imminent harm and that placement resources protective capacities are not sufficient to mitigate the risk of harm. And so this is a new policy. This was unveiled, I want to say, like back in January or February. This is a product of some work that the Barton Center did in collaboration with the Empowerment Youth. And again, this is a new policy. Uh, I am not clear on how much it's been um, enacted or is how effective it's been yet. But um, again, it, it is the policy of DFACS not to remove a, a minor um, mother's baby upon birth. Yes, sir. It's been wonderful. Oh, good. Because if, you know, if we had a minor mother, she already had a child and was pregnant when she came to care. And it was right when all this was changing. Oh, everybody excellent. Went, oh, we can just leave the child with her. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, that's so, I'm so glad you said that. And that's in part because of this Title IV e funding issue. And just to be explicit, um, I kind of skipped over it to get to the policy, but. Um, you know, Title IV e funding covers kids in foster care, and, and for purposes of, of this subject, in terms of what happens when um, a minor mother has a baby in care, mom receives her funding in her name and has her baby, and the baby does not need to be in foster care for mom to get additional funding. Um, I, I, re I read in this uh, Title IV e like, memo that it, it talks about you know, good social work practices uh, lend itself to ensuring that the mother has enough money to cover her needs. And if she has a baby, then certainly uh, one of those needs would be caring for that baby. And thus, the Title IV e funding is there for her to do so. Alternatively, mom may be in foster care and the baby may be in foster care, again, because mom does not necessarily have the protective capacities to care for that child, but they may be placed together. And so, again, you may still have the option, and that's certainly something to advocate for, that, you know, mom, if, if appropriate, mom and baby remain in the same placement, although the baby is in foster care, or you have the final option where mom's in foster care, baby's in foster care, and they're placed separately. So there's a number of different options here. And certainly, though, the ideal option is, is to have the mom and baby together and have the baby not be in foster care. Um, it's just an unnecessary action if, if, in fact, mom has the capacity and the ability to care for the child. So just so you all can turn to some resources should you need them, GCAP is an organization here in Georgia. They provide excellent resources. They, in fact, uh, run the Second Chance Homes, which some of you may be familiar with if you do have a pregnant or parenting client. Um, National Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy, they authored, they pretty much author everything that I rely on in terms of resources. They also um, made that video that we showed earlier. And the American Bar Association has this great book, Health for Teens in Care, a judge's guide, but certainly it's helpful to those of us who are not judges, and um, has some specific sections on reproductive care. And you can download this for free on the ABA's website. And so just to summarize, when you're with your child clients, and they might be of the age where they might become pregnant, feel free to ask the court to order education or health care anticipatory guidance for your child clients especially when you have a high-risk case, a young person that previously was pregnant may become pregnant again. However, let's be cognizant of the fact that none of our clients should be ordered or required to take birth control um, under any type of mandate. Certainly, they should um, be able to make that choice and that decision themselves and have it be an informed decision and an informed choice. Um, let's uh, work in collaboration with our caseworkers, convene any t a, a group. If this is an issue that you care about and, something, and it's something that you think is important, talk with your judge, talk with your social workers, work together to come up with solutions in your community. That's especially for some of the more rural counties. Um, it might be really great to get together a team to work on this issue. And finally, directing youth and caseworkers to resources. You know, I, I tried to name a few here that might be options for you. But again, turning to the uh, Title X clinics and looking at that website and seeing what's in your area might be helpful. And that's about it. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes? What is your understanding of the current status of this conversation about pregnancy prevention of state? 
the question was, what is my understanding of this conversation among defects workers? And I have to say, I, I don't have an understanding. Um, I, I, it's just not really where my expertise lies. Um, I tend to work off of what exists in terms of the law and the policy and go from there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one suggestion that I've tried to do um, in a few instances is to make sure that the written transitional living plan has a goal of um, sex education and pregnancy prevention in it. And so then you've got something in the written, you know, in the WTLP that then you can bring into court and ask the case manager, okay, this is in the WTLP, what have you done to attain this goal? And um, it just gives you an avenue. And actually, the defects, hints, or suggestions for what should be in a WTLP includes right. sex education. Just to repeat for those of you who might not have heard, as well as our friends um, joining us on the videotape, um, basically what was said in summary is that the uh, sex education, contraception, reproductive health care should be included in the transitional living plan. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there a policy or best practices model um, for whether or not there should be the same guardian ad litem for the minor mother and her baby, or if there should be separate guardian ad litems appointed for the minor mother and her baby? It's a really good question, and that's truly outside my expertise. I, I'm not sure. Does anyone in the room, can anyone in the room speak to that? I think it's fair to say there's no clear policy or guidance about that. I think that in individual cases, it's a matter of factual argument about whether the baby's interest can be conflated with the parents. And so then to the extent that they, as a, there's a fair reasonable argument that they differ, you want to appoint separate counsel. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and prior to uh, the point where defects stopped taking the babies, you know, from the mother, um, when our clients, our minor clients had, um, had children, we would request that a separate um, attorney be appointed to represent the baby. Our office would continue to represent the minor mother. Now that, um, again, defense has stopped the, the, you know, their policy of automatically moving to deprive the, the um, you know, the baby, that's, that's not as big an issue as it used to be. Did that help? Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Sure. As between, say, a foster parent and a, and a defect worker, if there's a conflict there, who's, who's, who, whose opinion prevails? What type of? Well, let's say that the foster parent doesn't want the child to start thinking uh, how to say, or, or has a different strategy than maybe the defect worker would have. Sure. Well, would defects be the ones that would? Yes, defects would be. I'd like to say that it is my opinion that defects <laughs> <laughs> that it should be defects that that should take precedent, and and rather that the law should take precedent over what the foster parent perceives as being appropriate, and. You know, certainly if we have a child that's not in foster care and is being cared for by their parent, that parent retains the right to make decisions about how they want to run their household and, and how they want to care for their children and, and direct the decisions that their children are allowed to make. Um, but when we have children in care, these children are, are wards of the state. They're covered by certain laws and certain policies that provide for access to the care that these kids need. And so in that instance, it would be, I don't want to say that it would be defects that would win, it would be the law that would make this decision and say that these kids should be able to access uh, the services that they need. But, you know, that's assuming that, um, you know, law and policy don't conflict with what's going on on the ground. And, and so um, that's in, in the ideal world, that that's how it would work. Any other questions? <laughs> We've talked a lot about squirrels and pregnant. What what strategies are being used to focus boys on not becoming parents? You know, it's a really good question, and I think in terms of our youth and care, a lot of the issues might be the same in terms of 
uh, some of the sexual risk taking that's related to emotional, sexual, or physical abuse. Um, but certainly I think there is a different conversation entirely that needs to happen. And even for organizations that make teen pregnancy prevention their mission, everything that they put out tends to be about girls. And um, there, even in articles that I've read, they always they acknowledge that there's not a lot been done about boys. And so I can't say that I'm familiar. Right, absolutely, absolutely. That's an identifiable issue that, that needs to be overcome. But when it comes to foster care and the law and policy, certainly it's gender, gender neutral. And so it exists as a vehicle for us to use for girls and for boys. Well, if there are no further questions, I would love to say that it's been an honor to speak with you about this topic today. I've put my card up here. Uh, I will be at Emory for three more days. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I've, I've had the best year here ever and loved this experience so very much. But my fellowship ends on Friday. However, my um, personal email address is on the back side of my card. Should you wish to uh, you know, correspond about this issue in the future, it's an issue that I care deeply about. So I'm not just going to cut off talking about it or thinking about it. Uh, on Friday. It's something that I will continue to care about long into the future. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And hopefully as a community, we can continue this conversation, especially uh, as we move into the future and start um, thinking about ways to prevent pregnancy among these, these kids that we all care so much about. So thank you very much. I, I'm glad you're here today.